the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the Apostle Church of the Book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth. This one's called Papal Power and deals with chapter 11 of the wonderful book I'm reading at the moment to you, All Roads Lead to Rome, from Michael Desemlian, published in 1993. This is one of the shortest um, chapters in the book, only five pages. There are some that are even four, I think, but this is one of the shortest one. And then it is called Papal Power. Papal power and one of the shortest chapters. How does that make sense? Well, when you really want to talk about papal power, you can write a whole book or even a whole encyclopedia, encyclo encyclopedia about that. A whole series of books. That much interesting and that big is the real papal power. And actually, when we go through this whole book, we will see that actually more or less every chapter deals with papal power. So I think this is just an unlucky name chosen for this chapter, because papal power is much more interesting and much goes much deeper than these four or five pages that I'm going to read to you right now. And if you really want to know about papal power, then go to the readings that Tom Fress did on Inquisition Update. Uh, he read the Global Vatican. He read Rome and Civil Power from James Aitken Wiley. He read uh, Rome... Uh, wh wh what's it called? Uh, Rome and Civil Power. Um, no, that was the other one. Eh? The Papacy and the Civil Power, it is called, from R. W. Thompson. Also a book that Tom Fress read on uh, Inquisition Update via First Amendment Radio. So uh, Francis Rooney, James Edgar Wiley, R. W. Thompson, the first three things that come into mind that Tom Fress devoted a lot of time to, to reveal the papal power. And there are many, 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 many more books out there who I all will do unjust if I don't mention them right now. So I just mention these three and ask you to do your own research in that regard. But let me tell you, papal power is a very, very deep subject. And of course, this book deals more or less in the whole book, with a little bit more than 200 pages on Rome and the papal power. So I just leave it with a little unlucky chosen chapter name. So on page 122, 
in that new chapter I begin to read, if you have your own copy and want to read along. Roman Catholicism is seen as a dual system. It is both a church and a global political power. Hallelujah! That's what I said for years, I want to say. Yeah, <laughs> about all the time that I have already studied this. Never to forget, first and for all, Rome is a political power. And the Pope even says so. Pope Pius IX, in his discourse on page 153, said, The Caesar, who now addresses you, and to whom alone obedience and fidelity are due. Unquote. Look it up. The Caesar who now addresses you. Isn't Caesar a political title? And that is the title the Roman pontiff has and wears. It is political power hidden under quote-unquote Christianity. Because it is not Christian. Within or without the reciprocal mutual assured destruction capability of the superpowers, the Vatican wields the greatest political power on the face of the earth. Yeah? Within or without the reciprocal mutual assured destruction capability of the superpowers. Well, they tell us that they have enough weapons to blow up the whole earth and whatever, but I do not think that they even have the codes or the keys to use these weapons. Why don't I think that? Well, because I listened to a lot of readings of Tom Fress where he speaks about that and I think that, of course, the Pope will never give any puppet that he has under control, whether we speak of the white of the, uh, of the, white or the black Pope, he will never give any puppet that he controls the key to destruction, eh? I guess he will, call, he, will, he will hold that for themselves. But of course the author says here that the Vatican wields the greatest political power on the face of the earth. Well, yeah, I think that even the Vatican has the power which those nations, USSR in the time and um, USA, obviously have been given, that the papacy holds these power. Now we're going to continue with a little... Uh, excerpt a quote from Vatican Imperialism in the 20th Century, a book written by Avro Manhattan. Quote, Although without armies, navies and super hydrogen, bomb, hydrogen bombs, the Vatican has more power at its disposal than if it had the greatest military capability. The Pope's government is as important as that of the USA, of Russia or of China except that territorially and spiritually it is far larger and it exerts more influence than the three combined." Unquote. Yes. There are some people who as often ask, well, how can the Pope have power? He doesn't have an army. Or are you going to call his Swiss Guard an army? No, I don't going to call the Swiss Guard an army. But what do I need armies for when I have all the armies of the world under control because I have all the rulers of these armies under control, I have all the countries under control, I control all the presidents, I control all the kings, as it is written in the Bible. And all the kings of the world have committed fornication with the beast. And all the world wandered after the beast. And he reigneth over the kings of the earth. Do you need more Bible quotes? to assure you of the papal power. Like other great multinational organizations, the Roman Catholic Church has a planned long-term strategy. The papacy has continuity of a kind that no other organization or nation on earth can even match. Nations and giant corporations are subjected to economic imponderables or electoral changes, but the Vatican is not constrained in this way. Now, wait a minute. I cannot just read this and go on like that. The author tells us, 
that nations and giant corporations are subject to economic imponderables or electoral changes. Now, that's true at the first sight. But you have to look behind the curtain, what we always try to do. And when you look behind the curtain, you know that the merchants of the earth are the Jesuits. They have control over all major companies in this world, especially in the time that we are talking of today, not 1993 when this book was published, but 2016. And we talk about globalism. And there are only very, very few companies in the world who hold the power to everything. And these companies are most of the time controlled by the sovereign military order of Malta. And if not, by the SMOM, then they are controlled from another organization that is subordinate, uh, subordinate to the SMOM, or anyway subordinate to the Pope, whether be it through papal knight orders or via be it through Freemasonry, which is, sub which is subordinate to the Black Pope. So these companies are just playing a game. And with the electoral changes, it's the same thing. When the Pope has the control over the right wing of a country and over the left wing of a country, for whom does the outcome of the electoral, of the electoral campaign matter? Think about that when you go vote this year in the United States. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think this video will come up when the election already is done. I don't know. Yeah, you elect somewhere in November. Today is the 3rd of uh, October, where I um, record this, but I don't think that this will come out until that time. But for whom does it matter, the outcome of the elections in the United States? Not for the Pope, not for the Black Pope, because they have the control of both sides. They don't care whom you're going to choose. Their candidate wins every time. And therefore, I have a little bit to disagree with the author here. Now, he says, but the Vatican is not constrained in this way. No, that's right, because the Vatican is actually controlling the economic imponderables and the electoral changes. The Vatican is able to plan well ahead. Well, that's absolutely right. Corporations plan five or ten years ahead. The Vatican is able to construct a strategy over many decades and can exercise the clout to implement it. History shows how Rome throughout the centuries has been able to steadily accumulate power and influence unless or until she overreaches herself or decides there is a need to change direction. Again, I do not agree with the author. The Roman Catholic Church never overreaches, well, except maybe for one example that we come later to when we talk about the Council of uh, Florence in 1439. That's for a little bit later in this uh, chapter. But um, she overreaches herself or decides there is a need to change direction. Well, <laughs> the Vatican never changes. It only puts another color over the veil that it puts on itself. But beneath is hidden the same agenda all the time. Don't forget that. Everybody else has to change. Rome itself never changes. For example, under Pius IX's Pio Nono in the late 19th century, she overreached herself and lost the Papal States and much of her temporal power. Well, again, this was the last wound afflicted to the beast <coughs> by losing the last Papal States and the last temporal power, but he regained it in 1929. Now, 1929, a very interesting year. In the beginning of the year, in the month of February, you had the Lateran Treaty, where Mussolini gave the Vatican back its civil power, right? And the Pope was accepted as a king 
of Vatican City, of his own state, in his own estate, right? Along with that, maybe you know that, maybe you don't, Mussolini paid the Vatican the nice sum of 750 million liras, which is about, I don't know, 100 million dollars or something at that time. That was in February 1929, with the signing of the Lateran Treaty and the healing of the, uh, of the deadly wound of Revelation 13, by giving the papacy back the civil power. At the end of the same year, in October or November, you had the so-called Black Friday, where the, uh, the whole money system crashed into oblivion on Wall Street, for example, and everywhere, on all the trading places in the world. Every stock exchange tumbled down that time. And why is that important? Well, because the Vatican got paid 750 million liras, which is about 100 million US dollars in the beginning of the year. What do you think they used that money from? when they control through, like I told you before, all the, civil, uh, all the papal knights, all the big companies, and the stock exchange, and the money system, and the Federal Reserve System, and they control all that stuff. Well, the Vatican was, po uh, was able to buy every big company for a penny, for a dollar. You know? And that gave the Vatican a lot, a lot of riches. And when you lay people think of insider trading, that is only for real insiders. The Vatican is the biggest inside trader worldwide in the worldwide stock stock exchanges. <laughs> stock exchanges, <laughs> believe me that. Do your own research on that. You will find out for yourself. In this meaning the 20th century. In the 1960s, under John the 23rd and Paul the 6th, believing she was no longer backing a winner, she totally changed direction. The Roman Catholic Church, eh? Pius XII, Hitler's Pope, policy of opposing communism, first by backing the fascist dictators and afterwards through the Cold War, spawning the rabid anti-communism of such as committed Roman Catholic Senator Joe McCarthy was abandoned. And again, I do not agree. When we read books like this, we want to know the whole truth. And by that we have to understand that the Roman Catholic Church, through the Jesuits, founded communism, founded the Russian Revolution, put in Lenin, who was Jesuit trained, put in Stalin, who was Jesuit trained, to get rid of the Orthodox, and started World War II and annihilated Europe to get rid of Orthodox Christians and to get rid of Protestants. Protestants in Germany, Protestants in England, Protestants of the United States of America. And whether you like it or not, you Americans, go to the book Vatican Assassins, Wounded in the House of My Friend, there and also in other sources, you can read that at D-Day, the platoons that went ashore in France, in the, uh, what's it called, in the Bretagne or whatever that, that shoreline is called there, where on D-Day, on the 6th of, uh, or whatever, of June in 1944, the Americans landed, the troops were specially selected. And you know, there weren't many Catholics. They were all Protestants. They were all troops of Protestants brought as sheep to the slaughter on the shores over there. They actually made a sacrifice there. I don't believe me. Look it up for yourself. The 30 years, the second 30 years war between, between 1914 and 1945, the First and Second World War, with an intermediate break of the uh, with a 20-year truce, as uh, Marshal Fox said at that time, that 30 years war was nothing else but a religious war to annihilate the enemies of the Roman Catholic Church that are 
the Jews, that are the Protestants, and that are the Orthodox Christians. So when we read here that Pius XII policy of opposing communism, however he did that, that was only outward policy and you have to look to the inward, to the secret policy of the Vatican to understand the doings of the Vatican. The author continues here, the Vatican had concluded that it was backing the wrong side. No, it was reaching its goal and when it reached its goal then it had to change directions. In came a brand new two-pronged strategy, both political and ecclesiastical, temporal and spiritual. Coexistence with both communism and capitalism, coupled with acceptance of Protestantism and other heretical religions or separated brethren, would provide the new route towards world dominion. So did anything actually change? No, the only thing changed was the color the Vatican put on. Or was the color different nations took on. All of a sudden, now in the 90s, 1990s of last century, the, uh, the Soviet Union is no longer the Soviet Union, it's Russia. Yeah. And um, they are back a hundred years now. Or did they take over the whole structure of the Soviet Union and the same people stayed more or less in power? What do you think? They just garment themselves with another veil. The veil changes of color, but the same beast is hidden beneath. As Khrushchev was turning away from Stalinism, so in the late 1950s were Vatican strategists turning away from Pius XII's policies. As the final plans for Vatican II were laid, so was the repro uh, rapprochement taking place, which would lead to the forming of the Vatican-Moscow Alliance. There is even a whole book written about the Vatican-Moscow-Washington Alliance by Avril Manhattan. Have a look at that. After the failed attempts of more than three decades of political interference to oppose Marxism, the Vatican set about working with it. As we have now seen, Marxism did not fare well with this new arrangement. And again, I have to tell you that this is just trying to blind your eyes. This is not true in the way that we read it here. After the failed attempts of more than three decades of political interference to oppose Marxism, <coughs> only officially, not behind the scenes, the Vatican said about working with it. Yeah? How does that come? Well, the holy alliance between Reagan and Pope John Paul II and the demise to bring down communism. It was all planned, but believe me, people like Gorbachev played all along and are as Jesuit-controlled as the other political players. It is just a theater they put in front of us. As long as the hands of the, fa of the, hand of the grandfather clock advance in the same direction as it always does, when the pendulum goes from the left to the right and the right to the left, the hands of the grandfather clock only further the agenda of the Vatican. And of course Marxism did not fare well with this new arrangement well officially, but I remember Khrushchev and I remember Gorbachev saying something in the sense like we will get you not by weapons, but one day you will wake up and see that you will live in socialism. And the point that you have to realize, my dear listener, is that socialism can come from the right and be called fascism, or can come from the left and be called communism but it stays socialism. So whether you are turning to the right or to the left, you are always caught by the beast called socialism. The new face of the papacy, conciliatory and more human, exemplified by John XXIII, was to be the face shown to the world that of Vatican II and the new ecumenism, and soon also that of liberation theology from Cardinal Bellarmine and the new politics. 
behind the face is the strategy and the plan to evangelize the world. This also includes the conversion to the Mother Church of Soviet Russia, as promised by Our Lady of Fatima. We shall be looking further at the Vatican strategy in the chapter Peace and Evangelization 2000. Yeah, surely. But you know that Our Lady of Fatima promised Russia to the Mother Church. Economic power. Paper power, economic power. The Roman Church's unparalleled wealth is legendary. Although in these days of careful image building, the Vatican is at pains to deny it and even to plead poverty. Yeah, the Vatican has no money. <laughs> the Vatican also has no power. The Vatican surely has no money. Yeah, are you sure? The Vatican riches are uncountable and we will read a little bit of that also here in this book and if you have any doubts on that I can advise you go to the book The Vatican Billions from Avro Manhattan or go to the book from Dave Hunt The Woman Rides, uh, the, Woman Rides the Beast and there you will see the riches of the Vatican which is much more than just gold and the money of the Federal Reserve it is incountable, incalculable ever. And it is like always when the Bible says you have to be poor to be good, more or less that's not the way the expression but the point is in the Bible the poor are the good and the rich are the bad and the Vatican is just the other way around. The poor are the bad and the rich are the good. Because you know when you can't buy indulgences and you can't buy masses for purgatory to buy you out of purgatory, you are poor, well, then you burn in hell, right? But when you have all the money of the world, you can buy all that stuff, well, you buy yourself to heaven. That's the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And so the Roman Catholic Church even pleads for poverty, but it actually is the richest power in the world. Always 180 degrees opposite what they teach is the actual truth. The frequent appearance of articles in the newspapers about the hard-pressed position of Vatican finances helped to foster this impression. Few people outside the system realize the uh, prodigious capacity of the Church to raise funds. In his 1957 book, The Vatican contre la France, oh, I have to read that in French, Le Vatican contre la France, meaning the Vatican against France, Edmond Paris described, quote, the gigantic financial power which the Vatican represents in the world today <coughs> oh sorry the gigantic financial power which the Vatican represents in the world today is it realized for instance that one third of the land in Spain is hers and that in South America she owns vast expenses and this does not include innumerable other properties spread over the rest of the globe. Already Peter Spence, from at that time 400 million faithful, legacies, offerings and masses all geared to helping loved ones through the pains of purgatory, ensure the Holy See a revenue that may be termed astronomical. One cannot help nothing uh, sorry, one cannot help noting that, from the temporal point of view, the Church's most beneficial years were those of the Second World War, at the end of which we have seen facing a Europe that was bloodstained, ruined and completely plundered by the Nazis, the Vatican overflowing with the most fabulous of riches. Unquote. The love of money is the root of all evil, as we can read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. And the love of money is the corrupted root of Christianity of the Roman kind. Candles, holy water, relics, indulgences, masses for the living and the dead, intercessory prayers by Mary and the saints, all are enormous sources of revenue for the Vatican. 
the income generated for the Church of Rome by the fear of the pains of purgatory by itself is simply awesome. Purgatory, first adopted in the 6th century pontificate of Gregory the Great and defined in the modern Catholic Catechism as that state of temporary suffering for those who die guilty of venial sins or who haven't haven't fully satisfied for the punishment due to their forgiven sins, flies in the face of all the scriptures. Christians have complete assurance from the Bible that those who have put their faith in Christ and have accepted Him as Savior and Lord have been entirely and forever purged and cleansed of all sin and all guilt by Him and only him. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin, as we can read in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. And when he had by himself purged our sins, as we can read in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. As you can read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. Jesus saying, It is finished, as we can read in John 19, verse 30, just before he gave up the ghost, meant that he had accomplished all. No sin remained which was not purged. Thus, purgatory as a concept is entirely unbiblical, but it has been extraordinarily profitable. It became official dogma of the Church of Rome at the Council of Florence in 1490, uh, 1439 and since then has extended the Mother Church's power over the souls of men and over their giving. No single idea in the whole of history has ever raised so much money. And what I think is an interesting point to think about is that when it became official dogma in the Council of Florence in 1439, about 1450 is the time of working and doing of the great morning star of the Reformation, um, John Wycliffe. That's only 11 years after the Council of Florence. I think that this is the moment when God in heaven said, it's enough. Now I have to wake up my people. They come, they make this purgatory, official dogma in the church, and all of a sudden the Reformation came along. And within a hundred years, the papal power and the papal income were lost for a big part. Remember, when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the church door at Wittenberg in 1517, his 95 Theses were not about the Antichrist. No, his 95 Theses were all about indulgences, were all about the wrong teaching of that you can pay to get your souls forgiven. Indulgences and purgatory, that was the protest all about. So I think that there's actually a connection between this Council of Florence and the starting of the Reformation. Another attempt at appraisal of the wealth of the Roman Church was made in 1983 by American author Avril Manhattan, and we read from his book Vatican Billions, quote, the Vatican's treasure of solid gold has been estimated by the United Nations World Magazine to amount to several billion dollars. A large bulk of this is stored with the United States Federal Reserve Bank, while banks in England and Switzerland hold the rest. But this is just a small portion of the wealth of the Vatican, which in the US alone is greater than that of the five wealthiest giant corporations of this country. When to that is added all the real estate, property, stocks and shares abroad, then the staggering accumulation of the wealth of the Catholic Church becomes so formidable as to defy any rational assessment." Unquote. 
Such wealth and a matchless organizational structure has enabled the Vatican's influence and will to be exercised invisibly and variously by orders such as the Jesuits and Opus Dei, the Knights of Columbus and the Knights of Malta, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, the Knights Templar, the Legionnaires of Christ and the Prieur de Sion, a Templar order involved with hermetic Freemasonry and with close ties to the House of Habsburg, and the Blue Army. Such organizations, legions of the papacy, zealously work for the Roman Catholic institution and within them allegiance to the Pope takes presence over every other loyalty. Just a little idea. Such organizations, legions of the papacy, when we turn to the Bible, when Jesus came to the shore and there was a man possessed by demons and he spoke with him and he asked what his name was and he said my name is Legion for we are many and we read here such organizations legions of the papacy don't you see the connection? In common one with another, and with Freemasonry too, they possess a very acceptable public image, a secret oath and higher echelons which are kept secret often even from their own lower levels. At the highest levels there is participation in other secret organizations such as the Rosicrucians and the Illuminati. Illuminati which is just another front organization for the Jesuits. We have looked briefly at Opus Dei in the previous chapter and, there are, and the chapter which follows is about the Jesuits because it's called the Jesuits today. The Blue Army is a worldwide crusade of some 20 million zealous Catholics who are obedient to the requirements of Our Lady of Fatima, wearing the brown scapula and repeating the rosary frequently. The Knights of Columbus have a membership of 1.2 million, 5,400 subordinate councils and according to the Roman Catholic Directory, quote, a comprehensive program against subversive activities, unquote. The secret oath for the fourth degree of the Knights of Columbus, unless it has been changed, which it hasn't, includes the following, quote, Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I shall and will defend this doctrine of the Pope's Vice-Regency of Christ and His Holiness's right and customs against all usurpers of the heretical of or Protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden and Norway, and the now pretended authority of the Church of England and Scotland, the branches of the same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere. I do now renounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince or state named Protestant or liberals or obedience to any of their laws, magistrates or officers. I do further declare that I will help and assist and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place wherever I shall be and do my utmost to extirpate the heretical Protestant or liberal doctrines and to destroy all their pretended powers, legal or otherwise." Unquote, as documented in the United States Congressional Record of 1913. The author finishes this chapter on papal power with saying that the Sinn Féin oath is in many respects remarkably similar, although phrased in stronger language. Again, I do not agree with this because the oath of the Jesuits is much stronger and also uh, much uh, phrased in, in much stronger language than this oath of the um, Knights of Columbus. 
but uh, for that you can turn to my video where I read the oath of the Jesuits, the oath of induction in uh, nothing but the truth more than two years ago and you can look that up for yourself. So, um, I've come to the end of uh, the quite short chapter 11, but still I made it uh, longer than the German reading. <laughs> uh, three minutes or so, some more. So let's stop the video right here and we will come together next time when chapter 12 reads the Jesuits today for 12 pages. We're going to sit down, I guess, for a little bit more than an hour. I have the feeling already now. Or maybe even two parts. Let's see. We'll see when it comes that far. Up to here, I thank you for listening, I thank you for watching, I thank you for your comments, and uh, until next time, Joggler66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you and bye bye. We as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, Take that information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people that they maybe have a chance. By going through this situation, maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way. Maybe they have a way to find to the real truth. I mean, these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called, quote-unquote, Christian countries. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course, the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up and that is the hope that we should have as bible believing christians and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends because jesus said love your enemies and love your neighbor